Welsh Marty seems to be a particular place where strong women wielded power and have what appears to be, um, to me, at least more agency and power than other women. And today I wanted to talk to you about women of the Clare family in particular. Um, so those of the Clare bloodline and those who married into it and who were a close, uh, closely associated to Wales and the Welsh Marches. So from Aoife McMurrah, the Irish princess, through to Eleanor de Clare, and her role in Edward II's court and obvious downfall. Um, life may not have been completely plain sailing, obviously, in the marches for these women. However, they seem to have found a freedom that they weren't afforded elsewhere. There is so much more to their lives and links with the marches than obviously I have time to talk about today. Um, but I wanted to give you a kind of taster about the lives of six phenomenal women, um, which might spark some interest and research of your own. So it's a whistle stop tour of the highlights rather than an in-depth investigation of any one of the women. So let me explain to you why I'm talking about the Clare women in particular. So one day I was at one of those days in Caerphilly Castle when they have like reenactments and things there with the family. And we were walking around and there were shields everywhere. And my family, no, I don't have many skills. I'm not really good for anything. One thing they do expect me to know is anything medieval. Um, it's like it's my thing. So I could identify all of these shields and there was one I'd never, ever seen before. Um, it was kind of, as you can see, it's yellowy gold, large green spread eagled eagle. And of course, that's the specific shield that my husband had to single out and say, oh, whose shield is that? Um, oh, my God. As my family all turned and looked expectantly at me, I was furious. So I had to stand there and admit I didn't have a clue. Um, the look of disappointment on their faces was crushing so I went home and I tried to search online for this shield and I couldn't find it anywhere so fast forward around three years later and it's still annoying me um, once again dragging my family around medieval sites and we found ourselves at Bewley so it was this one day as luck would have it that they had the falconer there he's not always there and he had birds and behind him, he had a display of coats of arms that had birds on them. And there it was, it was the shield and the green eagle. But this time there was a name attached to it, which said de Montherma. Uh, so as soon as I could, um, got online, looked it up and I found out that it was a coat of arms for a man named Ralph de Montherma. And just out of interest, I kind of wanted to read about him. So, Whilst his life was of moderate interest, I very soon forgot all about Ralph and began reading about his wife instead. And she was an amazing woman and I, I love her. So she'd be controversial enough were she alive today, um, let alone in the 13th century, and seems to have been far more scandalous than the current set of uh, female royals. However, we'll get to that amazing lady um, shortly. But this was the spur to the talk today um, and the combining of the women of this prominent family was the basis of my master's thesis. So the Clare family, um, their seat was in Clare in Suffolk and for just under 300 years, the Clare family played an influential role in medieval England, Wales and Ireland. So we're gonna start with, there she is, Aoife. So Aoife McMurrah, sometimes called Mac Macada. She was born in 1145 and was an Irish princess. So her father um, was Dermot, King of Leinster. And Aoife had been born into what was a highly militarised environment with Viking settlements and the Irish kings constantly fighting amongst themselves. And in 1166, uh, because of various nefarious deeds, Dermot and his family uh, were exiled from Ireland. And so not knowing what to do, they sailed to Bristol to gain support from a friend of Dermot, a Robert Fitzharding. So Fitzharding was a wealthy merchant and he was a childhood friend of Henry II. Um, they went to stay with him in Bristol and he suggested that they go and find the king. So they travelled to Aquitaine and it took months and they finally found, found him. 
um, Van Henry. Now, Dermot didn't get the paid army he hoped for. He thought king to king, Henry would understand and would give him uh, an army to go back to Ireland and reclaim his land. That didn't happen. But Henry did give his permission to recruit from men in the kingdom. If they wanted to, they could go to Ireland and help. Um, so the family returned back to Bristol and Dermot was pretty confident that with the um, transient shipping community, um, young men wanting adventure, he'd be able to find um, the help he needed for Ireland. But even though he got the, um, the call read out twice a day at the port of Bristol, he didn't get one taker. Nobody wanted to know. So it's possible that it was at the suggestion of Fitzharding. It's very likely it is. Um, the family went to Wales and found support from Richard de Clare, Earl of Pembroke and Stragill, which we now know as Chepstow. So Richard is also known as Strongbow, which you might have heard of. Um, Richard de Clare agreed to travel to Ireland with his men to reclaim Dermot's lands on the agreement that de Clare would marry Dermot's daughter, Aoife. Eventually, it took, it took a couple of years before the king would let him go, um, and he travelled to Ireland, which marked the beginning of the Norman incursion into Ireland. And as a result, he married Aoife at Waterford Cathedral in 1170. He was 40 and Aoife was 25. Now, under Brehan law, an Irish woman could not be forced into marriage and the land was her inheritance for life. And not so under Norman law. So Aoife technically must have given her consent to the marriage. However, even if she couldn't be completely forced, Aoife sounds to have been a very pragmatic um, woman who helped assist her father and would have recognised that the family would have remained homeless um, and statusless without her marrying Richard. So the most contemporary sources um, for information on Dermot and these arrangements with Strongbow are the Expugnatio Hibernica, The Conquest of Ireland, written by Gerald of Wells. Richard was described by Gerald of Wells as generous, courteous and gentle, and he was considered a commander in battle. There's a 13th century poem entitled The Song of Dermot and the Earl, uh, which also recounts that Aoife was given to the renowned Earl in honourable marriage by her father, who loved her so much. Aoife was made her father's heir, which dis she was not the oldest child, and it, it was unusual in Ireland for Dermot to settle his lands on his daughter, and this wasn't popular. It might have been due to his faith in her um, and her strategy and her advice, but it's also equally could have been part of the arrangement where Richard declared that he would take over. Very swiftly after the wedding, Aoife lost her father, and only six years after the marriage, she also lost her husband. A charter of Aoife's remains um, and concerns the confirmation of possessions of the Church of Dublin, so we can still see um, acts that she made herself. Um, in the charter, she describes herself as a countess and the daughter of a king. Aoife remained a widow for the rest of her life and spent time with her daughter and her son-in-law, and she was buried in Tintern Abbey, which her daughter and son-in-law were patrons of. She had left Ireland homeless and in fear, but she had found help in the marches and lived her life in freedom. Now, her daughter was Isabel. Um, Isabel was four when her father died, and she was taken and held is the King's Ward in the Tower of London. She literally sat in a tower waiting for a knight in shining armour to come and save her. Um, and for this 17 year old girl, her knight was 43 when he came to save her, um, a similar age difference to that of her parents. So Isabel had been given um, as a reward in for the loyalty of William Marshall. Uh, he was a prominent knight who became obviously an earl and owner of extensive lands through the marriage. Isabel was one of the most eligible and sought after um, marriage matches of the medieval era, bringing with her the large estates, the castles, wealth and earldom. And as soon as he'd been given permission to marry her, William had ridden straight to the tower to personally free his wife um, from a reluctant jailer who was King John's man ran off to Glanville. You didn't want to let go. So 
Isabel had been freed from her captivity, but she'd been thrown into the spotlight suddenly of the court. And what we know about Isabel comes from the history of William Marshall, uh, which was commissioned by William and Isabel's family. The history was written somewhere around 1224 and provides a great deal of information about William, Isabel and their children. Isabel, by all accounts, actively involved herself with the Welsh marches and encouraged William to take an interest in her Irish and Welsh lands. And she also played an important role in William's council and managing her estates. So Isabel de Clare was a powerful and influential woman at last. William always sought the Countess's opinion and she was an open advisor to him. William had been loyal to his royal masters, but working for King John proved to be difficult. William asked permission for himself and Isabel um, and their children to travel to Ireland to her lands, and John reluctantly agreed to the family travelling, but at the last minute thought better of it. He sent a messenger to William and Isabel, who were just about to leave, ordering one of their sons to be taken as hostage uh, for William's good behaviour. And John already at this point had their eldest son as hostage anyway. So on hearing the news, William took Isabel and his most trusted men aside to discuss the situation. And Isabel was reported to have said that she thought John was up to something and it worried her. And it was a sign of how comfortable she felt in giving her opinion to Marshall and his men um, that she could voice this. So although William was advised against it, he did agree to send their second eldest son to Richard to the king and they sent um, to they'd sail to Ireland. Although they were greeted there, someone in particular was said to have been less than pleased. And that was uh, Myla Fitzhenry, William's liegeman, a neighbour and royal justiciar of Ireland, who caused mischief um, in collusion with King John. And William was suddenly recalled home by the king. So before he left, William drew the barons and important men to him at Kilkenny and presented them with Isabel. He reminded them that it was her that was their lady by birth um, as daughter of the Earl and granddaughter of the King. And he instructed them to guard her well whilst he had to return to the King and reiterated that he had nothing unless it was through her and it was her that should get their loyalty. So by this point, a very heavily pregnant Isabel remained at Kilkenny Castle, um, was to be a target for uh, Myla Fitzhenry. As, as he returned to John's side, uh, Fitzhenry instructed his men to attack William's lands and convince John to call the barons back to England so they couldn't be there to defend Isabel or the lands. So Fitzhenry returned to Ireland, but John refused to let William leave. And Fitzhenry personally attacked Isabel at Kilkenny Castle while she was largely unprotected. Now, instead of just surrendering, Isabel was resourceful and she refused to surrender that castle. She managed to have a man lowered down unseen over the walls to get a message to Jean de Early, one of uh, William's men. And she managed to hold the castle until John brought reinforcements and they triumphed over Fitzhenry's men. So when William returned to Ireland, he was minded to be lenient on the hostages that had been taken, like Fitzhenry's sons. Um, however, it seems that Isabel wasn't in agreement. And as the history tells us, it was the Countess who wasn't happy when she heard that the men had been pardoned, for they caused her so much trouble and grief. And truly, if the Marshal had followed her advice, he'd have exacted cruel punishment. So this picture given of Isabel is one of a strong woman who managed her own lands and did not automatically just demure to her husband's point of view. So William and Isabel were not frequently together. He was busy with his duties and following the king. And Isabel was left in command of their estates when William couldn't be, a role she seemed to have fulfilled very well. Isabel did accompany William on a tour in the autumn of 1200, where they went to Chepstow and sailed to Pembrokeshire. And Isabel and William were often at their home in the marches, um, such as Goodrich and Chepstow. And they were also very generous patrons of Tintern Abbey. Isabel was willing and able to experience hardship and danger in a highly militarized society in order to defend what was hers. Isabel's importance, perhaps, though, is shown in how 
she um, was named in many official documents issued by either herself in her own right or by her husband and her son. And William often started his um, grants with the note that they were made with the consent of his wife. And the existing documents show Isabel's individual power and agency to bestow grants and deal with her own lands. So John there, he died. And even though they had this enmity, um, he knew he could trust William and he put his son under William's charge. He suggested it, um, Henry, the, the soon to be Henry III. Um, and at the, the ripe old age of 73, William became the governor or keeper um, of England in charge of the kingdom until Henry uh, attained his majority. So this would have made Isabel the most powerful woman in medieval England at the time. Um, three years after John's death, however, in 1219, William himself died, leaving Isabel a widow, and Isabel was said to have been inconsolable at the loss of her husband. So despite her grief, she still fulfilled her duties as a countess and as a widow, and Isabel promptly secured her own paternal heritage in Ireland, Wales, and England. She was also successful in securing her Norman estates from King Philip Augustus in July 1219. And despite the differences in their ages, Isabel only survived William by one year. Um, she died in 1220 and was laid to rest with one of her daughters and her mother, Aoife, in Tintern Abbey. So that brings me to the next woman um, in the Clare family I want to talk to you about. So she's the wife of Isabel's great grandson Gilbert and this is Joan of Acre. Um, as her name suggests Joan was born in Israel to Edward I and Eleanor of Castile whilst they were on crusade in 1272 and as the royal couple made their way back through um, Europe to home they left the newly born Joan with Eleanor's mother uh, in Pontieu in France and Joan was around five when she was finally recalled to live with her parents as her marriage had been due to take place to Hartmann, uh, Prince of Germany. Now unfortunately before he could arrive to meet his bride poor Hartmann died. Um, after being brought up in another country away from her family um, when she wasn't having to travel with them, Joan was very independent and she travelled with her own household. A very independent 11-year-old Joan travelled round Wales alone with her household, which, interestingly, only one of whom was female in that household. Joan was clearly used to giving orders and having them obeyed. And even in small ways, Joan, Joan was always a leader rather than a follower. At such a young age, she showed independence and what seems like a fondness for Wells. Joan's father eventually arranged another marriage for Joan um, when she was 18 to a rebellious 47-year-old Marches warlord named Gilbert de Clare. Now, Joan's mother, um, as we, we've heard before, um, was regularly um, accompanying her husband, Edward I, on campaigns um, and was independent commanding her own business affairs and the apple doesn't seem to have fallen far from that tree um gilbert de Clare, james new fiance was nicknamed gilbert the red and there's some uncertainty over the reason for that nickname some say it's because of his red hair others say it's about his angry temperament personally the more i read about him i think it's probably a mixture of both um he was not the most loyal of subjects and he had sided with um, de montfort and was a thorn in the king's side, living as he pleased in the marches and fighting against neighbouring barons. And it seems that Edward married Gilbert to his daughter to keep him in check. However, upon the marriage, it was quite clear that perhaps Edward had underestimated his new son-in-law and his daughter. It seems Joan was quite the match for her husband in terms of being stubborn and strong-willed and Gilbert held the lordship of Glamorgan and hundreds of manors in, in England, in Wales. Their lands included Caerphilly, Glamorgan, Usk, Newport, uh, Caerleon, where they mainly based themselves in cases of rebellion. As soon as they were married, the couple left the court. And instead, they went straight to Glamorgan without taking their leave of the king or queen. They just went. And Edward and Eleanor were so incensed with Jane that they wrote to her advising that the dresses from her trousseau for a wedding had been divided and given to her sisters. A true to form, 
the anger with her didn't last long and eventually the king gave Jane expensive gifts to make up for it like silver and gold as compensation and it often seems that her parents were actually Jane's pawns rather than the other way around and they could be manipulated into agreeing to her demands and forgiving her indiscretions. Gilbert put down a rebellion in Kilkenny in October in 1293 and Joan was at his side. Joan appeared to enjoy her life in the marches. However, the couple had to deal with restrictions on the power um, by her father, mainly due to Gilbert's behaviour. In 1294, uh, disinherited Morgan at Meredith caused a rebellion which was so fierce that Joan, Gilbert and their children only just escaped um, back into England from the marches with their lives. A year later, Gilbert died suddenly whilst at Monmouth, leaving Joan a widow in her early 20s. Now, her eldest son was still only a young boy and Joan was required to give her oath to her father for the Clare lands, which she did um, after she personally oversaw Gilbert's burial at Tewkesbury Abbey. As with, with any man who knelt before the king, given fealty, Joan was required to agree that she would not remarry without the king's permission. And this was especially important for Joan. Not only was she one of the wealthiest female landowners, she was the king's daughter. So she had a duty to marry as, as he saw fit. So Joan obviously was a huge prize for a suitor and her father formally and publicly accepted an offer of marriage from um, Count Amadeus of Savoy. But there was a problem. So before Gilbert died, he had in his household a young squire. Now, after his death, Joan suggested to her father um, that this particular squire should be knighted, which, which he was. But what Edward hadn't known was that Joan secretly married him once he was knighted and was already pregnant. So the newly knighted squire was Ralph de Monthermer, the Earl with the Green Eagle Shield, which started all this. So the marriage put her in breach of her oath for her lands. However, Joan clearly believed it was easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, by marrying an inexperienced man of her own choice, below her in social standing, Joan prevented her father sending her to a foreign country, as her sisters had experienced, whilst at the same time marrying a promising young man who could provide military power when needed, but she would remain in charge of their land, property and assets. So when Edward found out that Ralph was briefly, um, he, Ralph was briefly imprisoned, Edward was said to have thrown his uh, crown into the fire in a fit of anger, and Joan's lands were confiscated. So the king sent a man to find Joan, but she was secretly hiding at Goodrich Castle. Eventually, she realised she had to salvage as much as she could from the situation. So never one to kind of bow her head in shame, Joan faced her father and the barons and challenged what she viewed as their sexist views. She said if we were a man, um, they would not be complaining that her new marriage was beneath her. And she highlighted that a young husband could provide vital military support. So most likely the king had to be practical, realised, as the barons did, she was very visibly pregnant and the marriage couldn't be annulled. So the marriage was finally accepted and Ralph was released from prison at Bristol Castle after only 11 days. And it was said that Ralph had found himself hopelessly in love with Joan. However, it was only Joan in her position that could have taken such a huge risk and secretly marry her late husband's squire. And for Joan to do such a thing shows a level of confidence in her own power and agency. And this hadn't been the only occasion on which Joan had defied her father when Edward I had cut his son, the future Edward II, off from his finances and placed him under house arrest. Joan had sent her seal to her brother to use as he saw fit, which gave him access to her fortune. The prince was not as willing as his sister to challenge his father's authority and return the seal with his thanks, but refused to use it. Now, Edward I 
uh, came to approve of his new son-in-law. And Joan and Ralph were happily married and went on to have at least four children together. And Joan regularly accompanied her husband on campaign and continued to manage her lands in England and Wales and lived happily and prosperously until she died. So when Joan died, she left behind her Ralph, their children, but also the children she had shared with Gilbert. And by the time of her death, Joan's brother was now King Edward II, who arranged the marriages of two of three um, of the Clare daughters to his own favourites. Now, Edward II, Edward II famously had um, male favourites with whom he was so close. Um, these relationships obviously were his ultimate downfall. So Margaret Clare was 12 to 13 when her mother Jane died and her uncle swiftly married her to his favourite, um, Piers Gaveston. Now, Gaveston was murdered, obviously, as a result of his closeness to the king, and Margaret was then taken into the king's household before she was subsequently married to another of Edward's favourites, a man named Hugh de Audley. As Joan's eldest son, um, Gilbert, had died on the battlefield, Margaret and her two sisters became heirs to the earldom of Gloucester, which was eventually split between them but it took some time for them to get their inheritance because Gilbert's widow um, claimed that she was pregnant with his heir and was still believed up to 20 months after his death so Joan received um, sorry Margaret received uh, lands and manors in various parts of Wales but the husband she had been forced to marry fell out of favour with her uncle and rebelled against him. And Margaret was accused of being a co-conspirator and was imprisoned. So Margaret was only released when Edward II was deposed and Queen Isabella um, set Margaret free along with Roger Mortimer. Now, Margaret's husband, Hugh, was made Earl of Gloucester and Margaret lived the rest of her life as a free woman and Countess of Gloucester. Margaret's younger sister was named Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth was 11 when her mother Jane died and Elizabeth's marriage had been pre-arranged before Jane had died so that prevented Edward from marrying her to a favourite of his own choosing. Elizabeth had married a man named John de Burr and moved to Ireland where she lived with her husband and where his family were. Now Elizabeth's life changed when John died and instead of being allowed to remain under the guidance of her father-in-law she was ordered by Edward to return to England under his guardianship. So Elizabeth arrived in Bristol in February 1316 with instructions um, by Edward to stay at Bristol Castle across the Severn from Wales with the castle under the authority of Gloucestershire at that point. Edward presumably wanted to keep his niece close to him so that she wasn't able to marry anybody else and keep her lucrative lands under his control. But Edward's plans were thwarted. Immediately upon her arrival in Bristol, Elizabeth was allegedly abducted by a man named Theobald Verdon and they were married. Now, I say allegedly because Verdon, who was Justiciar of Ireland, claimed that he had not abducted her and that the two were betrothed before they even came to Bristol and that Elizabeth had willingly and freely married him. Now, it's difficult to ascertain whether Elizabeth had been used as an object of a man's ambitions or whether she was a willing participant in thwarting the king's right to choose her husband, just as her mother had done and perhaps actively used her own agency. The king's attitude towards her in later life seems to support that assumption. Furthermore, Verdon's lands ran close to the land belonging to Jane's in-laws, and following this surprise marriage, her ex-father-in-law continued on good terms with Elizabeth, so it's possible that Elizabeth had previously um, been betrothed, and after all, it wasn't the first time a woman in her family had married in secrecy to defy a king. Edward was absolutely incensed when he found out about the wedding. However, he didn't have long to wait before he could marry her off to a man of his choosing. Elizabeth was widowed within six months of um, her wedding to Verdon. Now, the pregnant Elizabeth wasn't given time to bury her husband before Edward sent his man, John to Charlton, with a letter and a mission to persuade her to marry one of Edward's favourites, a man named Roger Damery. And he left her in no, in no uncertain terms that she had to do this. So 
Elizabeth still tried to retain as much agency as she could, and she retired to a convent for the duration of the pregnancy. Um, she, in when she was, she had her division of the inheritance. She was given Usk, which was one of her favourite homes. Um, and as her sister Margaret experienced, Elizabeth's husband was arrested for rebelling against the king. Elizabeth remained at Usk, possibly hoping to stay away from the king's notice until she herself was arrested and imprisoned at Barking Abbey, along with her children. Damry died and Elizabeth found herself a widow for the second time at the age of 26. So due to her wealth, Elizabeth was able to make a vow of chastity to the church and she avoided another marriage um, without being required to take holy orders. So the evidence suggests that the king was far harsher in his treatment of Elizabeth than, than with her sisters and was constantly using her assets to reward his favourites. And Elizabeth had never been more dangerously vulnerable where her uncle was concerned than she was at the end of 1322 when he demanded that Elizabeth spend Christmas at York with him. So as soon as she arrived at court, the king attempted to have her sign over all her rights to Usk and her other Welsh properties. Elizabeth refused the demands and she fled, but the king's men chased her and told her that her lands would be confiscated if she refused to comply. So ultimately, Elizabeth had to agree um, or lose everything. So when Edward was deposed, Elizabeth resumed her friendship with Queen Isabella and made advantageous marriages for children. In 1326, Elizabeth spent a really extravagant Christmas at Usk, which had been restored to her and was no doubt a far more relaxed affair than the previous one when she'd been forced to flee the court. Elizabeth spent the rest of her life mainly living in Usk and Tewkesbury, and she died in her own home and made her own choice on where she was going to be buried and how her assets would be divided. She had def uh, defied and survived her uncle and dispenser and if frequented wells whenever she could. Which brings us to the last of the sisters, which is Eleanor de Clare. She was the eldest of Jane's daughters, born in Caerphilly. Um, Eleanor was already married by the time her mother had died, when Eleanor was only 14. And Eleanor's marriage had been arranged by her grandfather, Edward I, rather than her uncle. So at 13, she found herself married to a man named Hugh Dispenser, and at the time her her uncle was not a fan of her husband. It was expected that a medieval wife would provide her husband with heirs and Eleanor certainly uh, achieved this. So on average, from the age of 16, she was pregnant every two years throughout the marriage. And in initially, Dispenser wasn't especially well thought of at court and their income was around £155 per year, which was far lower than a brother-in-law who received £7,000 per year. And as the eldest sister, her prospects for maintaining her family's success may have seemed quite bleak at the time of her marriage. And it was Eleanor who led the dispute for her brother's inheritance against his wife, who claimed that she was pregnant 20 months after he died. As an equal partner with her husband, Eleanor brought the case to, of the inheritance in front of the Lincoln Parliament in 1316. And they argued that the sister-in-law couldn't be pregnant 20 months um, following the husband's death. But the case was dismissed and Dispenser was so frustrated that he attacked a baron in Lincoln Cathedral, punching him several times in the face and drawing blood. So Eleanor and Hugh took Caerphilly uh, in the division of the inheritance and the lordship of Glamorgan in the settlement. And they would also go on to receive Tewkesbury and owned almost all of South Wales. So through her inheritance, the couple's income had increased tenfold. And by 1318, Hugh Dispenser found himself a lot closer to the crown and he swiftly became one of the king's favourites and like previous favourites the closeness brought that jealousy and that anger and there were calls for a dispenser's permanent exile so on the 3rd of July 1322 Eleanor was given custody of Isabella's son John and this was a prestigious appointment highlighting her position as the king's trusted kin in her own right and as dispenser had risen in importance so had Eleanor. So things eventually turned um, sour between them all when Isabella reported feeling as though she was imprisoned and accused Eleanor of spying on her and acting more like a prison warder under the guise of being just one of the Queen's ladies. So Isabella had made an extraordinary claim against Eleanor and it was interesting to note that 
Long before she openly accused Spencer, she was vocal in her mistrust of Eleanor, which would suggest that at its time Eleanor was closer to the king than even the queen herself. She'd risen higher at court than any of her sisters, and despite the fact that when she first got married, Eleanor had been the only Clare sister who had failed to marry a man who was capable of making his wife a countess. Now, Eleanor is the only one of her siblings who was herself a favourite, rather than simply being married to one. Um, Hainer chronicler William Capellani wrote that Eleanor had become her uncle's mistress, uh, an allegation which was also repeated in a 15th century chronicle. Eleanor was reaping the rewards of the king's affection herself rather than via a third party. And for a time, she was the most important and influential female in the country. Rumours of an affair were not simply confined to Eleanor and the king, but Dispenser had been referred to as the king's husband. And among those complaining about her husband was Eleanor's sister Elizabeth. So as the sisters, um, her sisters found themselves being imprisoned, Eleanor couldn't have been closer to their captor. So between 1322 and 1326, Eleanor spent most of her time with the king. So alongside receiving ever increasing amounts of money, Eleanor exchanged gifts and correspondence with her uncle on the occasions when they weren't together. And when they were together, they often ate by themselves and even travelled in the king's barge alone, which may suggest that Eleanor was acting with autonomy rather than under her husband's direction. Now in the king's records, Eleanor is the only woman to be named as my lady other than the queen. She was a key political player, not just a passive wife. All the evidence suggests that Eleanor acted of her own accord and even approved of her uncle and the husband's actions. And Eleanor gave birth several times in the king's manners. Um, and by New Year, she was with her, her uncle again and her husband at Hanley Castle before removing to Tewkesbury altogether. Then in the February, Eleanor remained in the company of her uncle and husband at Barclay Castle. And at this time, Eleanor wrote a letter in which she referred to the Queen as our very dear lady, was clearly attempting to try and foster warm relations with the Queen, despite spending most of her time with the King. Now, Eleanor and Dispenser were at the height of their wealth and power when things quickly turned sour, and Edward had decided to remain with Dispenser and sent his wife and son in his place to negotiate with his brother-in-law, the King of France. Once she was there, Isabella refused to return to England unless Dispenser was banished. And when Dispenser remained, Isabella led an army to depose the king. Once there, Isabella refused. Uh, sorry, when news arrived that Isabella and her army had landed, the threesome, who had spent so much time together, swiftly separated. And Dispenser and the king left Eleanor alone to hold the Tower of London as they made for Bristol in the hope of escaping to Ireland. But their plans went awry when they were captured on their way to Caerphilly. Eleanor failed to hold the tower and was arrested by the Queen's men. At any point, Eleanor could have just escaped, but she held her position until she was taken prisoner. And it speaks of her fortitude that she didn't run. Her efforts were in vain because uh, she was soon incarcerated in the very tower she had so recently been in command of. And she was detained for 15 months. Dispenser was hung, drawn and quartered and for the first time in her life Eleanor couldn't call on the king for help. So Eleanor's most lucrative lordship of Glamorgan was given to Roger Mortimer as his reward and his support for the queen. So just under a year after um, Eleanor was released in 1329, William Lazouche, Lord of Ashby, um, the man who was responsible for capturing her uncle and husband and who'd even attempted to capture and kill her eldest son, abducted and married Eleanor. Now, this doesn't appear to be similar to Elizabeth's possible abduction by Verdon. It seems that Eleanor was completely at his mercy. However, once married, the couple rode together straight for Caerphilly and laid siege to her birthplace. So perhaps... Eleanor realised that although she was an object of Zeus's ambitions, he could be an object of hers and a way to regain all that she had lost. And it was one chance to maintain that Claire legacy. So despite what he'd done to her family members, her self-preservation instincts may have recognised a man who was willing to help her fight for what was hers and possibly reminded her of Dispenser. For her actions, Eleanor was imprisoned once again, and in 1331, Eleanor's lands were restored, which included Glamorgan and Tewkesbury. Uh, 
Eleanor had obviously been proud of her heritage. Well, she had owned Tewkesbury. She had donated money to the Abbey for new windows featuring her male Clare ancestors and thereby celebrating and preserving the Clare name and their achievements and emphasising her contribution to the family legacy. In 1337, at the age of 44, Eleanor died whilst at Monmouth Castle, the same place where her father had died. Now, Aoife and Isabel had lived privileged yet restricted lives, often in a landscape of war and military environments outside of England. And their husbands were chosen by the kings and their living was always within his gift and easily withdrawn. The king's authority was diminished whilst they lived in the marches and it allowed the women and their husbands the autonomy they sought. Aoife had found a home in the marches away from the constant fighting and the exile of her home country. In the marches, she could raise a family away from court uh, with her daughter going on to marry one of the most powerful men in the country. The marches offered both the princess and her daughter, the countess, the freedom and the chance to consolidate their legacies in relative safety. Eleanor's husband had engendered fear in men and women alike, a man with violent tendencies, openly regarded in some quarters as the king's lover, and yet somehow she'd found a way to make a successful life with him for two decades and had given birth to ten children. She had helped him to achieve great rewards over the course of their marriage, but it had ended with the king's deposition. Now, each of these women of the Clare line, whether through birth or marriage, lived privileged but restricted lives, and the king's authority um, didn't stop them from doing what they had to do. So Eleanor and her husband were powerful landowners in the Welsh marches, an area which was obviously important to both of them and a place where they could rule with some autonomy. When she was released from imprisonment, it was to one of her martial, ca uh, martial castles that she chose to live in peace, although it was there that she was ultimately kidnapped. Her martial lands were eventually returned to her and it was at Monmouth that she passed. So of all the women, it was perhaps Joan, however, who thrived the most in the marches. She was said to have actively enjoyed living there. She was used to travelling through Wales and Ireland and the borderlands allowed her to live away from her father's authority, even when there was a limit to the king's patience. Joan was still able to talk her father around as she had all of her life and lived that life on her own terms whenever she could. These women played their part in the fortunes of the Clare family and the marches played a key part in their individual power and authority. And I really hope you've enjoyed listening about them because I think they're absolutely exceptional women. Thank you.